Have you ever wondered how a person named Babyface Nelson could cause so much panic in the people he came across? Lester Joseph Gillis, nicknamed Babyface Nelson, was an American gunman and bank robber infamous for his horrific killings. So you can imagine how much of a terrorist he was that made the FBI declare him public enemy number one. Everyone expected that he would have died by the age of 25 in 1934 due to his notoriety. But the unexpected happened. Before we proceed, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you'll be the first to know when another video drops. Nelson, a young hoodlum who lived on the streets of Chicago, Illinois, was referred to by his gang as Babyface due to his youthful appearance. At age 7, Nelson was already in custody for accidentally shooting a playmate in the jaw with a gun. He spent over a year in the state reformatory. And at 14, he was already a proficient auto thief. Tire theft, armed robberies, and bootlegging were some of his illicit pursuits. Born in 1908, Nelson spent his entire life engaging in illicit activities. He was convicted of auto theft in 1922 and was committed to a boy's home. Two years later, this ruthless and reckless hardened gangster was released on parole. Five months later, Nelson was detained once more for a similar offense. While working for Al Capone in the years 1929 to 1931, as well as other bootlegger dealers, Nelson made the leap from small-time crime to worker syndicalism. Shortly after, he was let go because he was becoming violently out of control, and this further elevated his illegal activity to a higher social class by becoming a bank robber. In 1928, Nelson fell in love with Helen Wozniak, a sales girl, and they married. Wozniak retained the name Helen Gillis throughout their marriage. Nelson began working at the neighborhood Standard Oil Station, where a bunch of young tire thieves known as strippers were housed the same year that he met his wife. Around this time, he began hanging out with two wee gang members in the suburbs. In 1930, Nelson carried out several massive heists. The first occurred when he and his group stormed into the home of magazine executive Charles M. Richter, bound him with tape, and stole jewelry worth around $205,000. He also broke into his first bank, where he stole around $4,000. A few days later, he attempted another robbery attack by forcing himself inside a house, and he was referred to as having a baby face after being identified as one of the robbers. The robbers, known as the Tape Bandits, committed multiple home invasions in different cities. Nelson, a native of Chicago who gained notoriety as one of the riskiest bank robbers of the 1930s, spent most of his time behind bars. He received a one-year sentence for his January 1931 bank theft in Chicago. Nelson was transferred from the Illinois State Penitentiary in Joliet, Illinois after serving a year of incarceration to Wheaton, Illinois, where he would face another bank robbery allegation. Nelson spent his entire life in and out of jail. However, he eluded prison officers on February 17, 1932, as he was transported back to Joliet, where Nelson briefly resided in Reno, Nevada, before escaping to Sausalito, California. While in Sausalito, Nelson met John Paul Chase. They became good friends for the remainder of his life. Chase oversaw a network of people smuggling alcohol. The two worked together on several illegal projects. Chase was a potential dubious new partner to Nelson. Nelson worked with him as security for the truck transporting liquor. As the two men got closer, John Chase frequently referred to Nelson as his half-brother. On August 18, 1933, Nelson attacked a Grand Haven, Michigan bank. He then put together a new gang with Homer Van Meter, Tommy Carroll, Eddie Green, and other bad guys from the neighborhood. The first national bank of Brainerd, Minnesota was broken into on October 23, 1933, and $32,000 in cash was taken. Nelson shot wildly at passerby with his submachine pistol as he ran. Then, along with his crew, he grabbed his wife Helen and a four-year-old boy and left for San Antonio, Texas. The authorities found Nelson's location in the region in December. They went after Nelson and his team. This angered one of the robbers into opening fire while he was encircled by two detectives, killing Detective H.C. Perrin and injuring Detective Al Hartman. The surviving gang members fled in all directions. Nelson and his wife returned to California, where they met with John Paul Chase again. I'm sure you're wondering what happened next. After moving back to Chicago, Illinois in 1934, 
Nelson teamed up with John Paul Chase and his wife, Helen Gillis, and they joined the Dillinger Gang. While Chase stayed in Chicago, Nelson joined his wife on a brief vacation with the Dillinger Gang at the Little Bohemia Lodge in northern Wisconsin. When the FBI discovered where the gang was on April 22, 1934, special agents proceeded to the Little Bohemia Lodge. But the sounds of barking dogs alerted the notorious criminals of the arrival of the FBI. Some female associates were left behind, including Nelson's wife, Helen Gillis, as all of the criminals escaped in the dark. Nelson fled to a nearby home and forced his way in with two hostages. Special agents W. Carter Baum and J.C. Newman, as well as a local constable, arrived at the scene with their car, and Nelson ordered the security men to get out. But before they could comply, Nelson released fire, killing all three special agents with his automatic pistol and fled. Chase ultimately reconnected with Nelson afterwards. Helen Gillis met her husband and Chase about a month after her release. They spent a few days close to Wisconsin's Lake Geneva. But after several further armed robberies, some of which resulted in the deaths of multiple police officers, the government provided bounties for Nelson's arrest or details about his whereabouts. Finally, on July 22, 1934, the Dillinger criminal was shot dead by police. After Dillinger's death, Nelson, Helen Gillis, and Chase left Chicago for California. Some time later, they returned to Chicago, where they stole a vehicle, on November 26, 1934, and drove to Wisconsin. Samuel P. Cowley, an FBI Chicago office inspector, was in charge of Nelson's disappearance. On November 27, 1934, Cowley discovered that Nelson had been seen driving a stolen car. Inspector Cowley and Special Agent Herman Edward Hollis arrived in a different automobile, chasing after Nelson and Chase. Nelson quickly turned off Northwest Highway and stopped in Barrington, Illinois, at the entrance of Northside Park. Before Cowley and Hollis could get out of the car, Nelson and Chase opened fire at them with automatic weapons. Special Agent Hollis died from the quick shootout, which lasted four to five minutes. Inspector Cowley suffered a severe injury and died the following morning. Nelson, who was also severely injured, was helped into Cowley's car by Chase. Numerous weapons and other goods were moved from Nelson's car to the agent's car. Remember that his wife Helen Gillis is present in the picture. She had been lying in a field during the conflict. She hastily climbed inside the vehicle as Chase sped up. In the early hours of the evening, at about 8 p.m., Babyface Nelson passed away. The following day, in response to an anonymous phone call, FBI officers discovered his remains adjacent to a cemetery in Nile Center, Illinois. His wife, who had become a widow, was jailed on November 29, 1934. For violating the terms of her release, Helen Gillis was given a sentence of one year and one day at the Mila, Michigan Women's Federal Reformatory. How did things go with John Paul Chase? He was imprisoned as a result of the murder of Inspector Cowley. After being released in 1966, he was diagnosed with cancer and died on October 5, 1973 in Palo Alto, California. This story mirrors an action film in so many ways, so keep watching this channel for more intriguing criminal stories to come your way. Thanks for watching!